Daniel. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I, <clears throat> I think this uh, previous talk is a good, very good uh, introduction to what I'm going to try and talk about, uh, which is very similar in structure, just applied to non-human users. Um, and the question I want to propose, or, or what I'm trying to do, is use empathy to design with animal perspectives in mind. Uh, and this, this is an example of what it might look like. Uh, and, and it turns out that when you ask strange questions, you find yourself in strange situations. So this, this is me with a group of dancers trying to understand how barnacles interact in the colony. Um, um, and I think, or I feel, uh, I, I need to, to talk a bit about multi-species design because it's, it's, it's still a niche in, in the design community. Um, so my main field of study, or my main interest is in multi-species design. And, and what I mean by that is a design, a design practice that addresses the needs of both animal and human species and the interactions between the two groups. Um, and it's as, as, as a field of study or as a practice, because I use it also as a study but also as practice, uh, it's situated in the meeting point between animals, humans, and the artificial world, yeah, or what, what we design, or the technosphere, if, if you will. And, and it, it looks first of how animals interact with design, how animals are influenced by design, affected by design, how they affect design, um, but also about how human-animal interaction is affected by design and how you can look at human-animal interaction as designed experience. So not just leaving them to chance, but trying to influence them, trying to, to, to design the experience itself. Um, and, and, and there's, there's a, a multitude uh, or my focus is mainly on wild animals. So there's different disciplines like uh, animal computer, uh, computer interaction, which look mainly at companion species or at uh, domesticated species. And I try to look at uh, wild species. And there's, there's a multitude of wild animal species that live in proximity and overlap with human, uh, with human habitats. Um, and it turns out that they use design much more than we imagine. Yeah, so uh, studies show that within centers of cities, birds prefer to nest in technical elements than in natural elements. And this, it makes some sense. So for animals, they don't have these divisions. They don't have these, for them, there's environment, there's what the environment can afford them. And if there's a loft of a house which is heated by the, the house itself, maybe it's better to nest in there, like this lesser crystal does, than to nest in a tree nearby. Um, and animals take advantage uh, of, of human systems and use them. Um, and, and some of them we love, some of them we cherish, uh, some of them we constantly fight back. Yeah, we, we, we name them pests and we try to, to keep them away from our human habitats. Uh, and, and most of them uh, go about their business unnoticed and unaffected uh, by us and try to to, um, to use the environment the way they can. Um, and in, in the past decades, there's a shift in a few disciplines uh, uh, that started looking at this phenomenon. So, so first, conservation biology, which traditionally looks only at uh, nature reserves as places of conservation, uh, is looking more and more into human habitats, into cities, agriculture fields, uh, parks, um, but even abandoned industrial sites, yeah, and looking at the conservation value of these places. And on the other hand, we have disciplines who traditionally only looked at people, like uh, anthropology, um, uh, human geography, and design on its different disciplines that are starting to look also at how animals are affected by human systems, how culture is influenced by animals, what is the place of animals in, in human culture. So in, in the meeting point of these things, um, there's a need or a call to rethink human habitats um, and how we can include a greater diversity of species within them. Okay, so 
I won't go too much into details into this, but this, this, this is a framework, or this is where I'm, I'm coming from. Um, and, and when you look uh, at examples of design involving in, uh, animals, uh, you see that still uh, they're looking mainly, or, or the client, or the target is mainly human. So this is an example of, of uh, the duck lanes from, from London. And, and they're there to remind people that they're sharing the space with other species. But obviously these signs don't make any sense to the ducks. So, yeah, they don't know how to read them and they don't know how to understand that they should walk only in this lane. Um, and this is not the purpose here. Yeah? The purpose is to communicate something to people. But, but I, I feel that if we want to take seriously the task of including animals in, in, uh, in, in human habitats, we have to learn how to design for them. Yeah? Um, this is another example. Uh, so there's these uh, beautiful hermit crab homes by artist um, Aki Inomata. And, and this raises a question, what, what would a beautiful home mean for a hermit crab? So this is beautiful for us, but what, what would a hermit crab think of as a beautiful home for itself? Um, and considering animals as clients of design poses a lot of questions. So, uh, so the question, can we actually see the world from the point of view of someone else, if it's a blind person, then we can speculate, we can say maybe. If it's an animal, it's much harder to answer this question. Yeah? But still, what I'm trying to ask is, is there value in doing this? Okay? And this is the, the topic of my paper today. Um, sorry. Um, so the, the process of seeing the world from the point of view of other beings uh, is, is commonly referred to as empathic design. Um, and and empathy in design is discussed both as, as a trait and as a state of the designer. So you can be a more empathic designer, but you can also get yourself into a state of empathy. And this is usually why we place empathy at the beginning of the design process, where we want to focus our empathic um, abilities in a, a certain stage. Um, and, and there's different techniques, yeah, like we saw today, and, and like you all know, different techniques of emphasizing, of trying to, uh, to get yourself into the shoes of, of someone else. We have immersive techniques where designers immerse themselves in the environments and lives and experience of the users. Role-playing techniques where designers imagine themselves in the place and act out different scenarios. And simulation techniques like the goggles that, that you presented uh, and like the famous gloves that show uh, um, uh, how, how different people with different conditions uh, perceive the world. Um, and what I try to do is, 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 is to ask how might we imagine these techniques uh, or how much we uh, might we apply them to non-human species. And I've been, for the past years, together with my students, experimenting in a lot of different ways of how to do this and trying to borrow from a lot of different fields. Um, so, for example, here you see um, a kind of dictionary of the uh, body language of a prey mantis. And this was done in order to understand how a prey mantis communicates, or using dance or sketches and different, building different, um, uh, different apparatuses that can help us uh, experience the world in a different way. Um, and and uh, um, we try, we use, or we borrow from also from somatic practices, from, uh, from BMC, body-mind centering, or from focusing. So different somatic practices that can get us into a different state than we're used to being in. Um, and, and today I want to focus on one specific technique or one specific exercise that I call the Umwelt Apparatus. Um, and, and the term Umwelt comes from, from a monograph from uh, uh, 1934 by von Oxel. And I'll, I'll just read out the first paragraph of the, of the monograph. So this little monograph does not claim to point the way of a new science. Perhaps it could be called a stroll into unfamiliar worlds, worlds strange to us but known to other creatures, manifold and varied as the animals themselves. The best time to set on such an adventure is on a sunny day. The place, a flower-strewn meadow, humming with insects, fluttering with butterflies. 
Here, we may glimpse the world of the lowly dwellers of the meadow. To do so, we must first infan blow in fancy a soul bubble around each creature representing its own world, filled with the perceptions which it alone knows. When we ourselves then step into these bubbles, the familiar meadow is transformed. Many of its colorful features disappear, others no longer belong together but appear in new relationships. A new world comes into being. Through the bubble we see the world of the borrowing worm, the butterfly, or the field mouse. The world as it appears to the animals themselves, and not as it appears to us. This we may call the phenomenon world or the self-world of the animal. And this was written in 1934. Okay, and as, as a critique on the way uh, science was studying uh, animals and nature at the time. And, and my question as a designer was what if we could design this bubble? What would it look like? What would it mean to design the bubble and step into it? So I gave my students a task to conceive and build a device or protocol that would enable access into the animal's self world based on the animal's unique sensor sensory abilities, behavior, and ways of interacting with the world. And the students had to choose their own animals. And here you can see the rock dove, uh, the Nubian ibex, the fruit fly, gecko, crow. Um, the rock hyrax, which you, you can see down here on campus, there's a lot of them actually. Hedgehog, great tit, uh, cauliflower coral, uh, bee. This is a, 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 a local um, uh, insect bat, the fire salamander, and a, and a jackal. And, and these are all local animals, which uh, the, the students uh, had access to, or at least theoretically had access to, because this project, like all other projects in the conference, was hit by COVID at some point. Um, and, 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 they, and they could have access to the animals in order to interact with them and learn about them. Um, and, and they had to, to come up with different ways of seeing the world from the point of view of these animals. And, and in the paper, you, you can see the, oh, there's a short description of, of each one of the projects. But today, I want to, uh, to talk just about a few of them and, and mainly to focus on what we learned from doing this uh, experiment. Uh, so the first one developed by um, Ofek and Dana was an apparatus simulating the bees' uh, eye structure and visual spectrum. So they created a block made of straws that when you move it closer, and, and further away from your eye, you, you see different things in focus. And this is similar to the eye structure of, of bees that are made out of a lot of different eyes. And they need this because when they fly high above a meadow, they need to be able to focus on something very specific. Together with this, they also have a ultraviolet sight. And this shows them diff what to focus on within the environment. So the, the things they're looking for, the pollen, are usually il uh, illuminant in, uh, in ultraviolet. And they created a simulation using um, uh, illuminescent colors and ultraviolet light and this apparatus. Um, next one is, is uh, uh, by Oni and Yael. And they were work working with the great tit. Uh, and they wanted to to practice or to role play the different communication signs. And uh, great tits have a, a very, very uh, a wide spectrum of, of song. Uh, and they use it to communicate a lot of different things. And they were, uh, after a lot of field of the observations, they were trying to mimic this and trying to communicate between them. And then to see if the other person perceived what they were trying to tell, only using the, the codes of the great tit, of the language of the great tit that they coded. Um, she and Olga worked with the golden jackals, and, and you may be familiar with the howls of jackals. Um, and it turns out that when they howl, they're, they're creating soundscapes. So they, they communicate different messages when they howl, um, according to the size of the group, the size of the habitat, um, the state, so uh, how much food there's around. So for a golden jackal, hearing these howls around creates a, a mental map. And, and they know who lives where and what do they do. So the exercise she and Olga did was trying to communicate distances between them. So you, you maybe know this maybe from sitting in a cafe. If there's, 
if there's a, a couple speaking very loudly, they take up more space. So we have this concept of soundscapes uh, in us, and they were trying to uh, emphasize this and create an, an example. So within the class, there were different sounds, and people had to draw the different soundscapes. And then we compare them to see if we perceive the, the, uh, the landscape the same way between different people. Um, Evers worked with a fruit fly, and he was trying to code the olfactory language. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, I'll go quicker. Um, of the fruit flies uh, using different fruits in different decay um, um, stages. So uh, the question you may be asking is, is there value in these exercises and, and what, what it might be? Yeah, and what, in order to try and understand uh, this, I conducted 27 interviews with the students of the course to try and, and code and, and bring out different scenes uh, relating to empathic multi-species design and to understand what was the value for them. Is there value in this? Um, and I'll go over some of the, the main topics that came out. So the first uh, thing, or the most prominent thing that came out was this idea of deep understanding of the animal, uh, understanding the inner logic of the animal, uh, realizing that the animal's world is much more complex than we imagine. Um, and there was a concept that is really interesting and really important for us as designers, which is the, the idea of empathy and detachment. So when we think about empathy, we think about getting closer and interacting. But when we talk about wild animals, empathy is usually associated with detachment. So if we don't want, and design has a very, very strong domesticating power. So if we, don't, if we want to design for an animal but not to domesticate it, we have to practice uh, an empathy of detachment. So how do you design for someone without interacting and without creating a dependency? Um, the idea of similarities and differences between humans and animals came up a lot, and this was in both ways. The exercise stressed the similarities, but also the differences between humans and animals. Um, there was a lot of identifying with the animal, a lot of um, anthropomorphism, but in, in a good sense. So trying to think what is similar, trying to relate to the animals through our own life experience or our own human experience. Um, different feelings of awe and wonder towards the animals, uh, a change in perception of the animal, uh, people waiting to meet the animal again, uh, the animal becoming more uh, um, important in the life of the students. Um, um, the animal changed from uh, maybe uh, being scary to being less scary, less dirty, um, or, or more vulnerable and in need of protection. Um, there were changes in real world interaction. This was almost in all the groups. When you start focusing on an animal and learning it, you start seeing it everywhere and hearing it everywhere. And this is really, uh, people who do bird watching probably know this, that when you focus or you learn about a new bird, you start seeing it everywhere. Um, a lot of curiosity and motivation uh, towards designing to, uh, to the animal um, and, and an empathy or, or want to um, um, to, to interact with the animal and take care of the animal. And then the idea uh, of the accuracy of empathy, and this relates to your last question, C can we really see the world from the point of view of someone else? Um, and if we can't, what is the value in trying to do it? And, and this came out a lot, and for the students, all of them acknowledge the limitations of their uh, um, trying to see the world from the point of view of other animals, but all of them said that it was value, valuable nonetheless. Um, so just to conclude, um, creating the device and using it um, um, ex expose them to the animal's uh, perspective on the world. Participants seem to gain a deeper and more holistic understanding of the animal, greater respect and empathy towards the animal, and increased motivation to design for the animal. Thank you. <laughs>